Hey everyone, this is Nick LaRue from Film Snobbery. I am here uh, to chat with a couple of filmmakers, one of which I uh, just met at the Salem Horror Fest here in Salem, Massachusetts. We watched their film, It Doesn't Get Any Better Than This. I'm going to let them introduce themselves. Uh, take it away, folks. Hi, I'm Nick. I'm Rachel. <laughs> Nick and Rachel. <laughs> um here. So yeah, uh, so for the folks who haven't had an opportunity to uh, watch this movie uh, at, at a, their local film festival or their local theater yet, explain to them what It Doesn't Get Any Better Than This is about. Well, uh, <laughs> it is um, a movie about um, three people chasing their obsession with the supernatural um, far past the point of rationality or um, good... <laughs> good sense um uh until you know the the worst that could happen happens um it's uh nick and i play ourselves we buy um this abandoned duplex um to make um our next horror movie and we start seeing uh random people standing outside it staring at us and being like horror movie fans we're like ah fuck yeah this is creepy and exciting um and then just kind of trying in the process of uh trying to kind of find out as much of what's going on as possible and kind of uh just continually poke at that um and and fuck with the creepy things that are happening in the duplex um we uh we we really get uh we, we we're trying to make the scariest possible like the our characters in the movie are trying to make our what's turned into a scary documentary about our lives as scary as it can possibly get and we succeed admirably, um, un unfortunately. Yeah, the only uh, thing I was going to add, but you kind of got it in there at the end, is that it's a found footage. Movie it's a found also. footage but movie. You said so you said sorry. you said, did eventually get to yeah, making okay. a documentary. Really so, eventually. Yeah. No, it, it's it's an I I you know after after having seen it, it was it was really interesting to me. I love the the house, the duplex, the production value off of that is fantastic. Um, the uh, the Rachel's unflappability in that movie is the thing that like for some reason sells me entirely on the premise, which is like just it doesn't matter how weird or or creepy or or spooky or anything anything got. She's just like. This is so great, isn't it? Like, isn't this so awesome? Look at all this creepy stuff that is happening. Like, I can't believe that there's just now a hellmouth in the house. I'm gonna go, <laughs> go sit in the stare at the hellmouth for a little while. Like, it, it's it's you know, who are these weird people standing? I'm gonna go and yell at one of them just for shits and giggles. You know, it's such a weird kind of um, it's 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 a weird but yet so interesting character kind of. It's not even a character flaw in any way, shape, or form. It's like it's a character choice that you know how. How close would you say that is to you as a human, as, as an actual person? Yeah, it, I mean, in, in ways it is because I do, I mean, I, I fucking love being scared. It's obvious, you know, it's, as a horror movie fan, that's obviously something I, I seek out quite a bit in my life. I like, um, doing, having spooky good times is how we, how we phrase it. Um, I'm, uh, yeah, there's, um, a moment. That's yeah, right. We literally do. There's a see, there's a section in the movie called Scary New Year where it's like we just get together with our friend Christian and we all try to scare each other and just, you know, get get spooky good times. And uh that's that's actually what we do on New yeah, Year's. Yeah, that's our New Year's tradition. Yeah. yeah. Um and uh yeah, that's that. So I I wouldn't say I mean, I'm a lot dumber in the movie than I probably like I'm a much more reckless in the movie than I would be in uh real life about it. But um we we did make some fair, fairly dangerous choices shooting the movie. So I'm not I'm not that much smarter than uh, than this maniac I'm portraying. So yeah. Yeah, and that was just one of the things we when we were making the movie because the movie was we sort of had a plan for it uh, and we sort of made it up as we went along uh we had a, we had a we always had a plan but we were always willing to deviate from the plan either if we came up with something better in the moment or out of necessity for whatever reason and uh one of the so we would come up with sort of i guess guardrails around our concept and that we would just be like okay how would our character act here one of the very early things we came up with was oh we 
couldn't think of any other horror movies where the people who are having scary things happen to them are just thrilled by it. <laughs> and we were like, well, and also we're not really good actors. And so we had to come up with things that we could actually do. And I have more faith in Rachel being inappropriately enthusiastic about scary things happening than I would have of Rachel pretending to be scared that scary things oh, yeah, are happening. No, no, so she was, not. we knew that she could sell that performance. And also it ends up becoming kind of even more unnerving the more it goes on because it's like, oh, this is, this is not, uh, at first you find the behavior maybe charming, but the more it goes on, you're like, there's something off about this. There's some, there's something unsettling about this or with this girl. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so one of the, 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 the interesting conceits about found footage, and we've experienced this with Blair Witch, we've experienced it with paranormal activity. There's this audience factor that kind of comes in where the idea is supposed to be that like you, even though sometimes we go in, we know like what we're watching is a movie. It's a, it's a fake, it's a movie movie, right? But because of the way it's shot, because of the authenticity of the performances, because of things, you know, various aspects to things, uh, there are a lot of people who tend to think that some of this shit is real. Have you have had any experiences yet with people going like, oh my God, well, where, where's Rachel? Is Rachel okay? Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. Uh- I actually, I I met someone at Salem who the next day, uh, and it was another filmmaker, which I found especially surprising, but but they were like, I think their friends had explained it by that point that no, it, it wasn't a job. It wasn't a documentary. It was, it was fake, <laughs> but this person was actually genuinely upset at the end of the movie because they really thought that Rachel had gone missing that, or that, well, spoiler alert! But they thought they thought that they thought that something bad had happened to Rachel. Um. So yeah. Yeah. Well, and we've even even though, but like we're we're playing like I guess a bit of a different game than like Blair Witch, um, and other some other found footage movies that kind of purport themselves to be real as kind of the marketing gimmick. Um, ours is that we're we're actually just putting in some stuff is actually real from our actual lives and just footage of us even you know from like 20 years ago just being ourselves and some of it is stuff that we staged so the game of what's real and what's not is a bit of a different um game than than what you'd normally be playing but we we also have showed it to like friends of ours who didn't know what was real or not or like our friend is like texting us one of our friends was like texting us while watching the movie um for so long into the movie just like what the girl's outside your window what <laughs> like the whole and then eventually was like yes i i realized i thought for a lot like way longer than i should have this shit was real and you just yeah we're we're making a real move a real documentary but yeah so that's fun um (laughs) yeah it's less um yeah the because i mean is anybody going to be actually convinced that a found footage movie is real anymore like has that actually worked since blair witch i don't think it has but I think what people are liking about our movie is that we're not trying to convince them that it's real. Mm -hmm. We're telling them it's fake, but then showing them a lot of stuff that actually is real. And then they get confused by it. And confusion can be fun if you're doing it right. And I, 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 it seems like maybe we did it right um, because people seem to be having fun with it. I think that, you know, a movie like this coming out around, a time like now is is really interesting and i mean i know we all talk about like blair witch had its moment back in the day but it was also in a time where like that was one of the first kind of mainstream successes of something like that happening and it kind of grew through like you know college screenings and stuff like that but now you folks are doing something where now we're in this age of misinformation where most people on a daily basis are questioning what is real around them anyway, based on things that they're seeing on the news. And there's even things that people will say like, oh, you can't believe that. And I'm like, I just saw it. I saw it with my own two eyes. I'm like, yeah, but that's not real. And I'm like, you know, so it's it's really interesting to be in that situation of um, at a, this particular time of like, you know, uh, is it or isn't it? And then to put out something that is this mishmash of of the reality from your lives, but then not, and then with a supernatural element and all that, it's it's a really interesting um, 
kind of uh if we're, i think it's a good marketing point obviously um but, but the funny so, thing about that is that yeah. i think you're actually the first person that's ever brought that yeah, up yeah. Um, and i think that that's i do think that's a really a, a, astute observation because uh, I also think that that's kind of a one of the ways that horror works is that if you look at the classic horror films that really impacted people, they're usually not the ones, not not always, but they're usually not the ones that have an overt message to them. Like if somebody sets out to make a movie about with a feminist message uh, and, and it's going to be a horror movie, that's probably not going to be as impactful as... I don't know, something like Rosemary's Baby. Like, I hate to suggest that Roman Polanski maybe wasn't a feminist, but, you know, I'm, <laughs> I don't really, I don't really think that was his intention. But if there's certain uh, uh, issues that come up through the movie that are then about uh, a woman's uh, relationship with her body and, and a woman's relationship with agency, you know, the fact that those things are subliminal ends up making the movie yeah, and it gives people like you you know it gives the film critics something to say like oh but you know why this movie's working so effectively is because it's exploring all of these anxieties that exist in society mm -hmm. and you know and, and that means that for the viewer who's not thinking like a film critic necessarily uh they get to kind of experience it like a dream and in our dreams, we're always processing stuff that we're experiencing and feeling anxiety about, but it then gets kind of shifted and you don't recognize it. You don't know what it means, but really it's just your brain kind of like making these movies for you in order to deal with stuff that you already feel anxious about. So in a way, like, I think that that's really astute for our movie. It's in no way intentional on our part, but like the fact that the movie is coming out in this moment where that's a concern and yeah. also people are responding to it. Cause that's really where, where the, the uh, I think the validity of the argument comes from is that you go, Oh, well people are reacting to it in a positive way and maybe don't know how to articulate why other than to just be like, I liked it and it was scary. But one person literally said like, I've had, a, there was a scene in this that was literally just like one of the worst nightmares I've ever had. Um, which I think does speak to that, like, you know, people are just processing, like, they're, they're recognizing their, or not even recognizing, they're under the surface recognizing their own, like, anxieties. Yeah, this. there's and something it's... that it's tapping into, and, and I think it's like, I, I do think that the, the post-truth thing is probably a factor that I think, uh, the, the sort of, like, panoptic state where you know we're we're always being watched by cameras of some sort and we also always have the ability to be watching things with cameras and stuff you know i think that's part of it i think social media is part of it and all of this is stuff yeah. that's not in the movie yeah think to do any of this on purpose either right. like we're not so brilliant we were just like oh our friend said that he had someone staring at his house and that would be a what what could creepy thing could happen at this dude yeah we were like what's cheap that we could pull off and having i mean stare at a house was that's so that's also i mean like from a timelessness standpoint i mean that's that's the the conceit of Freddy Krueger in A Nightmare on Elm Street. Uh, it, Wes Craven based that character on when he was a kid, he looked out his window and there was just some guy that had a passing resemblance to what eventually yeah. would be Freddy Krueger that was just sitting there staring at his house. Yeah. And so, yeah. you know, that that those things tap into the these kind of, I think, primordial kind of like, you know, ideas in our head yeah. of like what horror or what, you know uh it gives us the, i think you actually said it right which is anxiety you yeah. know and there, i think there's so much to be anxious about these days that like you know if a, there's never mind any just a single person staring at my house if a group of people ne you know uh, uh, is staring at my house i'm less concerned about like what the hell are they staring at more than like why is there a group right you know like like groups now scare me you know yeah. and, and and i think that there's subliminally even to the idea of like there's a group of people staring at this house um, in the movie, and we are all as a group staring at a group of people staring at a house. Right. In the movie. Mm -hmm. No, um, there's there's a scene in the movie that again, this wasn't really we didn't really think about this uh, intentionally. We just kind of conceived of the scene and then shot it. But um, it was and it was actually it was the author David Shields, who's a very uh, a, a very good touch point for this conversation too because he wrote the book reality hunger which is all about 
blurring fact and fiction and and nonfiction writing and stuff like that. But uh, he's a big fan of the movie, and he was the he he pointed out in a thing that he wrote about it uh, that you know there's a scene in the movie where. I'm filming Rachel who's looking at secu- looking at a computer showing security camera footage and she's taking a picture of the security camera footage to text to her friend. So it's like a camera taking pictures of a camera taking pictures of a camera. <laughs> and it's like, you don't get a scene like that, even by accident, you don't get end up with a scene like that in a movie that's not in some way concerned with these issues that we're talking about. Uh, even if it's beneath the surface, like it's if if we were cute about it it would be annoying and super meta but yeah. like because it's just presented so matter of factly and also yeah. because like that just is the world we live in you know right we are like well, how I'm many just... times have you just taken a picture of your computer screen because it was e- the easier to show somebody what you were talking about than yeah. you know like yeah. like we do that stuff all the time but like that's a really odd human behavior that we've developed evolution didn't prepare us <laughs> for using our thumbs to be able to take a photo of another screen and t- text it to somebody who lives like 800 miles away from you but but and it is removed from the context of the photo right yeah uh, the yeah. original material um no has uh, rachel has, has anyone experienced any type of like if you were at attending a screening right this whole thing is about watching you on a on a, on a, on a in a movie uh that is shot like reality that they see you go through all these things and then spoiler alert you know something happens to rachel but then you're at the screening has anyone ever experienced a re- like you can visibly watch them experience cognitive dissonance of like yeah. wait i can't my brain will not allow these two mm-hmm. things to be true at the same time oh yeah a lot of people have that sort of like it is so freaking weird to like see you after watching uh the end of that movie and also i've got like a really close friend who just for weeks after she saw the movie was like, God, I just keep thinking, I'm so glad Rachel's okay. (laughs) Like every time I see you, it feels weird, but I'm just so grateful you're here. (laughs) Like, and I was just like, yeah, great. I love that. I love that response. But yeah, no, definitely there, there are some people we, I always sit, we always sit way in the back as far back as we can in the theaters when we're watching it so that we can, well, we've also milk that moment. Yeah. We've developed, um, because we try to go to as many of the screenings as we can. And, you know, that's not going to be possible indefinitely because we're luckily we're starting to get a lot more interest in it. So um, and unless if theaters wanted to pay us to fly out there and stuff, which isn't going to happen, you know, it's just not going to be practical for us to go to screenings. But when we are able to go to screenings and we're both able to be there, I was the only one at Salem. So we didn't you didn't get to see kind of our our show. Well, you saw part of it. You know, I I led a ritual before yes. the screening, and these are sort of we we kind of have developed a, a little bit of a show that we do to kind of like lead people into the experience of watching the movie. Then they get to watch the movie, which has this kind of ritualistic experience with it. And then we do another thing that I won't I won't give it away, but sometimes we do. Uh, we have a little, a little bit of a, a, little, a pageantry, a that, little pageantry um, around. To, here's Rachel. Yeah, how how Rachel is able. Yeah. to we bridge the gaps of the two realities. We, yeah, we essentially we create a portal from the reality of the movie into our reality, yes. and we bring Rachel back through that portal. Oh, is I mean, perhaps the way to say it. It's fantastic, though. I mean, that level of showmanship just is not. It's not common. I mean, I can count maybe shit I, on one hand in the 16 years i've been covering films how many that that aren't giant spectacle films you know what i mean like indie films i can count on maybe one hand minus three fingers uh <laughs> how many of those uh types of uh eventizing kind of things that i've seen over the years and i think that that's that's i mean that's what makes it worth it for people to come out that's what makes it personal for them and for you um, you know, that's what makes it worth the t- the cost of the ticket or the trip out, you know, the, the babysitter at home, whatever, right. the, mm-hmm. you know, wh- whatever it is they've got to do to put that butt in the seat. Like that's just that little extra bit. Um, the other thing with that too, is that, you know, we, <clears throat> and it's funny because now we're 
uh, we're we're starting to get more attention for the movie, but uh, we just had a uh, article in Bloody Disgusting that came out yesterday, and they really emphasized the live theatrical uh, release plan for this that we're not going to ever do streaming and all that, and uh, and we started getting a lot of people, you know, saying, "Oh, fuck you guys for that," and uh, you know, a lot of people aren't liking that, and. Um, I actually just blanked on why I started talking about this. So no, and you, I, I will say though, as part of that, because I we were talking oh, about Oh, I was talking about the, the the live experience. So no, I got it. So I'm gonna got it? okay, go ahead. I'm gonna go back to it. No, so well the funny thing is that now people are saying, Oh, this is just a, a cynical media ploy that they're just trying to get more attention for their movie. But actually it's not true. We we made the decision before we even decided what the movie was going to be because we knew that we wanted to work with certain friends and we were like, what are we all comfortable with doing mm -hmm. if we're going to be fictionalizing ourselves, if we're going to be incorporating this footage of us from growing up, things like that, you know, like, like that's a very personal decision. And, you know, uh, so, so we said, okay, this is what we're comfortable with. We're fine with people seeing it in theaters. We don't ever really want to release it online because we, you you just the have images it. of yourself online like we want to control what those can be yeah it's it's there forever or <laughs> like... or at least like i don't know like there's just there's just something that's personal about it and we also didn't really fully expect the movie to get as much attention as it's yeah. recently started getting and so we just really for our own sort of sanity reasons and practicality reasons we just said this is the way we're going to do it and then we said okay, well, how can we kind of build the experience of the movie so that it plays better in a live crowd? And that's why we have some scenes in the movie that are, uh, 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 they're kind of challenging scenes to sit through that, and intentionally so because the conventions of being in a movie theater demand that people not be on their phones, not be talking to each other. You know, there's there's more of a, uh, uh, it's more of a social faux pas to break that, I'm paying full attention contract uh, without alienating your, yourself from the audience. And then we started, as we started screening it more, we started realizing, oh, there's a real opportunity here to keep adding to the experience, the live experience, because if we're in the room, there's some fun to be had with that. So we started mm -hmm. adding, adding some like pre-screening uh, stuff to it, post-screening stuff to it that, that just makes the whole thing. So the whole thing has actually been very organic in developing that stuff so it's so that's why it's funny that we're now seeing people being like right. oh it's like basically like we're some we're like some slick hollywood big shots who are here with with this like marketing team that's saying blah 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 yeah yeah we we made a movie in rural missouri with our friends like this trust me like nothing could be farther from the truth like just just imagine if someone was like you know what? Fuck you for not putting your home movies online. Yeah, like, yeah. Why isn't your grandma's wedding online? You know, <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. No, I mean, and you know, you're also creating to some degree. There's an urgency there. I mean, it's only he, you know at this place for this period period of time. If you want to see it, it's there for you to see. Um, it, you it's know. true because we everything's so on demand right now, and with the streamers, it's like I mean, realistically, some of you folks who are saying like. I'm so angry I can't see this. Would you watch it tonight or would you put it in your queue and shutter and then forget about it? Yeah. And, 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 then, and then never watch it. Like, I, I don't know. Or watch the first 10 minutes and be like, oh, wait, but I don't know. Now I'm tired and I just want to watch The Office. <laughs> like, yeah. I don't know. And like, we're not above this behavior at all. Like, no, we do this shit all the time. Yeah. Like, like we're, we're as guilty of anyone as of having right. something I put on my watch list two years ago that I'm like, I should watch that. Yeah. Not tonight, but you know, but, I should... but if a movie's in theaters, like literally any horror movies in theaters, we'll make an effort to go. Yeah. We'll stay there like and we'll you know pay attention to the to the movie and you know yeah. you're, it's you're, usually a better experience than watching something at home so you're avoiding know. something else too which i think is really key for the longevity of a movie like this and i think that this is also when we go back and we talk about specifically like blair witch not that i want to make like giant comparisons to it but like again it's a time uh time and place kind of thing is um uh, Blair Witch was ostensibly just uh, on the burgeoning side of cell phones. Mm -hmm. We weren't really dealing with cell phone cameras and stuff yet. 
and streaming was not, you know, what it is today. Um, most people are not going to go to a screening of your movie. And I say most because there's a dickhead everywhere, but are not going to go to a screening of your movie and they're not going to like have their phone out and they're not going to record the whole movie. Um, they, you know, they might st snap a still in the beginning, maybe of the credits or something to go show their friends or whatever, but they're not going to like record it. Once it's on streaming, every single frame of that movie is now available for dissection. Yep. And yep. so you are of kind of also avoiding the uh, the idea of no one was able to do that to Blair Witch because cell phones weren't there. Mm -hmm. It wasn't online. Streaming was not a thing uh, to that degree um, until years later. And then it allowed the mystique. It allowed the 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 legend of of the Blair Witch and all these kind of different things to um, grow. And it wasn't just immediate like uh conspiracy s takedown of this thing like how every article you see now is the ending of blah 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 explained and it's like right. you know and they're showing you a bunch of stills and all the cinema sins of it and all these other kind of things that happen with this particular movie you guys are not subject to that same level of scrutiny because mm -hmm. the only way you can see it is by seeing it live and having that live personal experience. The only takeaway I could even particularly consider that would be negative in any way, shape or form would just be like people who are still maybe immunely compromised from, you know, COVID or, you know, uh, are not able to afford going to a movie or something like that. But there are other ways of still getting that experience. Well, the the other one that for me is, and this is, this is actually something that it's what I, when I have my moments where I'm like, ah, should we have done it this way is when there's people who are from small towns, like we're from a small town. And it's like, there's stuff that you just don't get access to. And I don't like contributing to that sort of like, oh, well, if you live in a big city, you get it. And if you live in the country, go fuck yourself. You know, like I, I don't like that dynamic and I don't like being a part of that dynamic. And but that but is the magic at the of same time. That was, that, that's the magic of independent film, though, is that there that local person can contact you directly and say, "What can I do to get this here?" Versus it being a larger Hollywood style movie where there's if it's not playing at their place, they're not getting it until it comes out on streaming or video. Right, and we right. have had that happen where yeah. you know we did we did a screening in Decatur, Illinois, which is not a big city, but we we screened it. We brought a. Uh, it was like a four hour drive for us or something. Mm -hmm. We drove out there. We brought a projector screen, a projector, a giant Bluetooth speaker. And uh, the guy who booked us had, got like 25 people there. And uh, we just projected it in his driveway. And it was a great screening like yeah. this. And, you know, this is not ideal. Uh, I mean, I love showing the movie in a good space where like, it's a, it's dark and there's a great sound system, all that, but it also doesn't need that. If the, if the people are there and they want to see it and they're enthusiastic about it, we can do a great screening wherever. And now that, that of course is complicated because we don't really make money doing this right. and we also have jobs and stuff. And, and so it has to be like somewhere we can drive to, you know, like yeah. this, is, this is work for us. Like we're going driving hopefully getting some gas money out of it and uh and really just doing it for the love of showing the movie and connecting with people yeah. no and, and you you what you're doing is you know you have uh your movie specifically is it, it's so media dependent in terms of how you're you're showing it like if it wasn't a found footage film if it was an IMAX film showing it in some guy's uh, uh, driveway may look problematic. It just might, it right. might not fit. You know what I mean? Like yeah. it, just may, it may be a skew, a scance. Uh, but you know what you uh, with, with a found footage film, like, you know, it, it doesn't get any better than this. You know, you you're, you're in this situation where you could show that almost anywhere. As a matter of fact, showing it in a, in a proper, like, movie theater where everything's dialed in the color has been corrected to to all hell like you know like i used to run screening rooms in hollywood and we everything had to be mwah, top notch right. because you had you know color you had people like debuting movies there for like cast and crew screenings and stuff like that or for distributor distributor screenings and stuff and every frame had to be perfect um in your case the worst off the venue is or the more challenges to the venue or to the to, to the projection almost the better the experience yeah um, well we experienced that at salem the, the yeah. screening you were at where and i don't i don't know that you've even 
technically seen the end of the movie because the the screening room that we were at there was lighting issues yeah. and the very last shots of our movie are pretty dark there's not nothing happening in it it's just that what's happening is happening in a dark space and you could not see in that room anything that was going on but at the end people were like that was the scariest ending like that you know like people were going nuts because they, like their brains filled in the blank they they yeah. saw things that they wanted to see and yeah. it was almost even better because i didn't have a single person come up and complain i couldn't tell what happened at the end they all just made up in their minds what it was and that was amazing <laughs> yeah i agree yeah. and you're absolutely right no i didn't i couldn't see from my angle and also from because there was that purple light yeah that was yeah. shining on. which by well, the way there was... like in some case some scenes added like it was like this yeah. is actually working for me no i had somebody ask if there was they were like did in this one scene did you have like a cgi effect because it looked like this character's face was melting and i was like no that was just because the lighting was fucked up in the room like <laughs> but i'm glad that you experienced that uh that's another thing anytime somebody is like did you use cgi I was like no I'm too dumb I don't know how to use a computer <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like I we, it's like no we use practical effects because practical effects it's like you point a camera at it and you get it uh and like CGI it's like I need to know how, who to talk to like I don't know how to do that stuff. god yeah how far how far was it into your marriage before you both had the conversation of like let's make movies well, Nick's, you know what? I Austin, I feel like yeah. When we moved, Austin, we finished grad school in uh, in 2010. We both were getting actually here in in Kirksville. We were at the school here. We were getting master's degrees in uh, literary studies, and Rachel was also writing screenplays, and I was becoming interested in making movies. Uh, because actually it had just occurred to me because like mumblecore was kind of be a buzzy thing then. And yeah. I was like, oh, people are making movies for like a thousand bucks and they're actually being taken seriously. And I never really thought I loved movies, but I never really thought, oh, I should make movies. But when I was like, oh, that's something that would be within my grasp. I can put together a thousand. I can save a thousand dollars. And and if that's all it can take to make a movie. Uh, you know, I, I think I could do that. And we decided to move to Austin. They had a, uh, uh, supposedly anyway, had a, had a great indie film scene. Um, I did have, a, I, I uh, yeah, I, I just w would volunteer on people's movies and learned how to make movies that way. And then we started making stuff together, uh, as well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it, it was a long time from the time what we we started, we tried to make a movie together and it a little bit led to our divorce. <laughs> um, yeah, we had a movie called Scary New Year, Scary which New Year. people watch. Uh, it doesn't get any better than this. You'll you'll uh, recognize mm -hmm. Scary New Year. And but... we will someday make. Yeah, also, we are. We way. are going to make Scary New Year. Um, It's the it's hopefully the plan is that we do. We did it doesn't get any better than this. We're about to shoot Homebody, our next movie. And then we want Scary New Year to be our next movie after that. But yeah, our first attempt of making Scary New Year in 2012. Didn't uh, go to plan. Yeah, we got a divorce at the end of um, and didn't <laughs> yeah. finish the movie. But then, but then we got remarried and I feel like it wasn't I was in we were we got remarried move or we moved to LA, got remarried, and I feel like it was still a couple of years after that before we started making movies together. I was like trying to be a a real screenwriter and um boy just making your own shit is so much more satisfying and easier and yeah. more fun than please 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 mr producer will you give will you make my movie and also give me a thousand notes on it that are going to ruin it <laughs> yeah can you make everything that was good about my movie bad and also <laughs> and also probably never make it and also probably never pay me for it <laughs> like yeah but uh, the other though you did leave some stuff out in that we weren't necessarily working as partners on movies but i've always been incorporating rachel into my movies that's because uh, you no, know that's true when you get when you get a star like this <laughs> the, with this charisma this, this <laughs> oh this yeah uh you know you just gotta it's, it's you a have an there. awkward life like rachel is in my my new documentary the complete history of space time destination milwaukee rachel plays the narrator in it i so. often play the narrator yeah rachel often plays the narrator. yeah 
Yeah. What's your so. Rachel? What is your documentary voice? What's oh. your what's your what's your documentary narrator voice? Yes. Uh Sigmund Snowpack moved to or like lived grew up in Milwaukee for blah 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 blah. It's like it's got a real cadence to it. I wish I could remember more of the lines of narration it's, in your yeah, but movie, it's not but... very memorable narration. So yeah, I, I wrote it. Rachel's the writer, so when I'm writing the narration, it's very like meat and potatoes. Like mm -hmm. I'm just trying to get there. So and and uh, you just had a, a screening of that movie uh, over this past weekend, right? Yeah, the, it was. Um... So, yeah, I spent seven years making it, uh, premiered it. It's six and a half hours long, uh, premiered it in Milwaukee on Sunday and then Sunday night, put it out for free on YouTube. So for all you haters out there who are saying, <laughs> oh, you guys, just a media ploy. You're just trying to get that. I've got lots of stuff available for you. You could just go watch it anytime you want. And yet for We're some free. reason, yeah. Nobody seems to care about that. All I uh, all I heard was is that I'm going to withhold this awesome horror movie from you <laughs> until you watch my six hour documentary yeah. <laughs> about this obscure musician. <laughs> yeah, I should tell people that yeah. if, if you get to the end of this, then I will let you. You need like I'll the send you a, I'll send you a yeah. password yeah. Uh, to watch the movie. <laughs> That's that's it. No, yeah, uh, yeah. Watching the the documentary earns you a free movie ticket when and if this movie comes to uh, comes to a theater near you. Right um, yes. there, you go. Uh, and then uh, what's uh, what's the deal with Homebody? What's that about? Ah, um, that is the movie that we bought the duplex for. But then we got to the duplex and it was just like such a complete like nightmare, like filled with trash and terrifying graffiti and stuff that we we were like, oh, we would have to clean this up. For homebody because that movie's a it's a narrative i wrote the script there's two broke people living there but they are living there and so we were like we would have to make this nightmare den look like people lived here and that's going to make it less scary so why waste this scary production value um and that was why we ended up shooting it doesn't get any better than this uh but homebody um is about a um a young widow her um her husband you you meet her and her husband briefly uh at the beginning of the movie um her husband has just gotten a terminal cancer diagnosis um and um he dies like 10 minutes into the movie it's like the first 10 minutes of up but as a horror movie <laughs> um and then she's whilst uh grieving and just kind of like uh locking herself into her home and uh not talking to anyone shutting everyone out she goes for a walk and meets a homeless woman with a sign that says talk to the dead 20 bucks and she um can channel the ghost of this woman's dead husband but it's really gross and painful and it like hurts her and hurts her body to do it um and uh the young widow's like well i'll um I'll I'll let you come live with me if you will just keep doing that so I can keep talking to my husband and things get more fucked up from there. So it's like a it's a little bit of a draw of a fucked up drama, a little bit of a ghost movie, and um and 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 a little a, a little, little bit of monster a movie, little bit of monster also, movie but... too. It's a very I... odd, <laughs> gross, um, emotional emotional apocalypse is yeah. my brand um <laughs> of movie so yeah yeah it's... rachel likes to be like what's an emotionally complicated situation and how can i make it go as badly as possible even transcending what is possible you know <laughs> so True. well i mean i think that that's that's a, a good a good you know, line of, of, you know, when describing horror movies, it's, you know, uh, in general, which is like, what is the worst possible thing that could happen to this person? And then jack it up to 11, yeah. you know, yeah. uh, to the point where it becomes, whether it's supernatural or just, you know, I, I even supernatural, not in the ghost wor way of, of saying right. like, mm -hmm. extra normal. Um, yeah, no, I think that's great. And, and uh, you know, speaking of uh, folks here who also uh, have a, a master's in literary, you know, literary degrees and whatnot, uh, you guys also run a little small print press, uh, Die Die Books. Die Die Books. Uh, yeah, well, we, God, well, when we moved from LA to rural Missouri to make horror movies, we also, we were like, well, we should also do something to kind of uh we wanted to be more of a horror like 
I don't know, like it, like our own little cottage horror industry. Yeah. Uh, and we being kind of bookish, bookish people. And I'm, pr I'm a, I'm a go getter. I'm a DIY person. I like figuring things out. I also like reading. Uh, and Rachel has experience working in ind indie publishing and I have friends who are indie publishers and she had the idea for doing a series of books on individual horror films, each one written by a different author. Uh, and I started asking some of my indie press friends about like, how do you do this logistically, blah, blah, blah. And we basically just said, this is what we're going to do. We're going to, we're going to move to somewhere we can afford to live. We're going to start reaching out to authors we like, ask if they want to write books. Uh, and and we also kind of asked around enough to try and figure out what's a way that you can do this where you're not screwing people over uh, and, you know, but also hopefully not screwing yourself over. And and I've had a historically had a bad time uh, make trying to make money off of stuff that I'm excited about. I'm really great at doing this stuff. Yeah. <laughs> I'm great at doing the stuff I'm excited about. I'm not great at being a businessman about it. So this one was also kind of weird because it was like, well, the goal is going to be for it to be a for-profit business. Now, we are not yet succeeding at that. Um, <laughs> but I'm proud to say that our authors make money before we make money. So um, but uh, but yeah, but we I actually I have some books here. These are the four books we've done so far. We've got uh, Poltergeist by Jacob Trussell. We've got Threads by Bob Milkey. We've got The Wolfman by Philip J. Reed. And just last week, we published Sleepaway Camp by BJ and Harmony Colangelo, nice. uh, which Brian Fuller shared on Instagram because uh, I guess uh, not everyone from Hollywood is an asshole. Not everybody, <laughs> yeah. no. I was lucky enough where most of the people I met when I was uh, when I was living in L.A., we're pretty good people. Uh, there were a few dicks. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> to be <laughs> fair, were, were I I wasn't really connected to the industry at all. I was making movies, but I was just doing it the same way I do here, like where it's just I get people I like and we make yeah. stuff together. Um, so I I actually had a great time living in LA. Rachel had the bad time because I, she was she was trying to do the whole Hollywood thing in which the is, belly of the beast. Yeah. God. <laughs> Terrible. Um, yeah. 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 No, I understand. But no, I I love what you are trying to do in terms of or are doing uh successfully actually because you can see all the proof of it. Um in terms of like you you're you know, I think your mentality is right in terms of like create this little cottage industry around you because I think we were talking a little bit off camera of like, you know, you need to have more than one or two things going on because some things are going to succeed. Some things are going to fail. Some things are going to take longer than other things to, to manifest and all that. And so if you have more things that, you know, more irons in the fire that are going, you have a better chance of putting yourself in a position where once something does hit it, you know, it hopefully will continue to hit. Um, and uh, I, I th wish more filmmakers kind of, you know, had more of that mentality, whether it would to their, to their to their production company, you know, the idea of like, OK, well, what are you running? You are running a company you're ostensibly a small business person. So, you know, uh, whether or not you're doing merchandise, whether or not you're you're, uh, you know, uh, doing books, uh, doing additional material related to the movies that you're doing or working with other filmmakers or working with, a, you know, whatever. I think that that's a, it's a, it's a must. I think that the economy, the way that that is and the way the times we're in, is just such a, um, a need to have more than one hustle going. It's kind of like how no one, well, you can't work at McDonald's anymore full time and support yourself, right? Like you just, you have to now have something else going at, to, to kind of feed the beast. Uh, for one reason or another, I think that's great. And I and you've you've got. Uh, by the way, who uh, does the same person do your covers every time? Or yes. yeah, it's a, a, a illustrator named Andy Siasco, uh, based out of San Francisco. We actually, when we were at Unnamed Footage Fest a couple months ago, we we got to meet him in person for the first time. So that was nice. Oh, that's cool. um, but but yeah, he uh, yeah he's he's really really good. Uh, and I knew when we when we started doing it, we knew we wanted to do black and white and we wanted to alternate the covers white on black black on white mm -hmm. and I stumbled across his work on some horror blog and I was like this is perfect because that's exactly what he does some of his stuff is white on black some is black on white we really liked the sort of 
uh, scary stories to tell in the dark esque vibe of it. And uh, yeah, and he's been great to work with. So uh, yeah, I, I I like Andy's work a lot. That's great. No, I I no, I really like it. I like the aesthetic. It's very. It's both. Um, it's minimalist, but at the same time has personality. Mm -hmm. um, you know those little splashes of color. You know, and in some cases, and and uh, you know, I get you're right. I love the the spine. You know, alternations. Um, that's great. Well, I, where else is it? Doesn't get any better than this going to be screening uh, sooner? What's the plan going forward with that? We just got into Portland Horror Fest, um, so that's the next festival we're doing. Uh, we we unfortunately won't be able to attend that one because we'll be in production on Homebody when it happens. Um, we also have we have a screening at a theater coming up in Seattle at the end of May, and we have one in August in Kansas City. Um, and we have one in September in Chicago. So, and people can see details on our website. Um, yeah. What's the website? I'm going to pimp that out. Die die books .com. And die die books. For, for the movie stuff specifically, click on the die die video tab and it'll show you where all our upcoming screenings are. That's fantastic. Well, I look, I, I, I uh, for those of you who are not on the interview or, you know, uh, the audience here like we were already chatting for like an hour hour and a half before this so i've taken up so much of these people's times so i feel uh, incredibly uh self-conscious and bad about it but uh thank you very much for for uh you know sitting down and chatting it was great meeting you nick when i was actually at you know physically at the salem horror fest and rachel great to see you and that you're good you know and meet I'm you fine. face to face she's fine folks she's fine she's right there or is she um yeah this could be a deep fake this is so. this is you know ai is just uh it's, it's infiltrating every aspect of our lives um uh all right well folks uh i'm gonna i'll end the, the interview here and just i'll say uh for anyone else who is looking to check this out you can check our review of uh it doesn't get any better than this over at filmsnobbery.com uh this uh interview if you're not watching it on filmsnobbery.com maybe check out this interview and others over on our youtube channel uh and uh everything else you can also check out our event calendar where i'll be and uh and all of that Thanks again, folks, uh, for Nick and Rachel for first, you know, saying hello. And I'll see you guys on the, the festival circuit. Woo-woo!